Hi, it's Jan Peter, and this is a follow-up video to the previous one I did about the use of bipolar or polarized capacitors in the Amiga's audio circuitry that turned out to be a more complex topic than I anticipated and it led to uh, Gadget UK 164 making a video answer to my video and apparently making another video answer to that. I'm going to link in the whole uh, discussion of the topic below. And I learned so much from this, from the comments section and also uh, there were people contacting me on Twitter and uh, I had a bit of a conversation with Gadget UK. And this, this is a really interesting topic because it's about uh, how to measure these things correctly and also uh, if this circuit is indeed badly designed or if it is okay. And in the end it all boils down to the question if it is a good idea to use bipolar capacitors in this circuit or not. So today I'm going to try to summarize some of the uh, things I learned from the discussion about this and uh, take a look at some schematics and measure stuff again using my gained knowledge from the uh, discussion. So the first thing I want to do is to apologize for stating in the last video that uh, capacitors actually block DC voltage, which is of course complete nonsense. I think uh, it was really really off-the-cuff video, I didn't really plan it that much. So I think what I thought was uh, of a capacitor in a configuration like this, where uh, it is this the positive side, the negative side, uh, where it would be in parallel to a voltage source, for example, uh, as used as a smoothing capacitor, if you have like a uh, rectifying circuit here, as a smoothing capacitor in a power supply. So I was thinking that it would uh, do something like this and smooth out the voltage and pass DC. But of course in this case it is uh, wired up in series with the circuitry. So it is blocking DC voltage effectively and uh, letting the AC voltage through. Which of course makes more sense if you want to have a, an audio signal at the output. <laughs> so let's take a closer look at the circuit. So this is the schematic of the whole circuitry. This is from an Amiga 500 revision 6, I believe. Uh, but it is virtually the same as in the Amiga 500 revision 5 that we were looking at. And it's very similar in other Amigas of the same era. And apparently all Amigas up until the Amiga 4000 that had an additional op amp in the circuit uh, to cope with CD audio, actually. <laughs> We're going to look at that in a second as well. So Paula is the audio chip that generates the audio signal. Uh, there's our little LF347 op amp that amplifies the audio signal. That is fed with uh, 12 volts positive and 12 volts negative voltage. And then we have our little decoupling section here. Let's take a closer look at that. So here's what our audio channels look like in the schematic um, op amp. This is the decoupling section, two little capacitors uh, in series to the whole circuit uh, in parallel to each other, which is one uh, ceramic little 0.22 microfarad cap C335 and C334 22 microfarad cap that we were looking at, polarized cap in this. And on the positive side is connected to the output of our LF347 op amp. Negative side is connected to the audio out and to audio ground, which we were going to have a look at in a second. So the ground on the RCA jack actually is ground like uh, earth ground 
this is like the case ground in the Amiga. So it's the ground coming from the power supply, which is reference to the uh, protective earth in your main socket, basically. So audio ground is another thing, I believe, but it might just be reference to ground too. We are going to have a look at that on the real thing. So what I was arguing is that uh, in order to be able to use a polarized capacitor, there would be some sort of bias that is added to the signal that outputs here from the op amp and has to be added somewhere before. And I was looking at this schematic and then I found something that says VREF, voltage reference, which is input into the uh, op amp for both channels actually, VREF is on pin 12 and on pin 10 and the other side is a uh, reference to audio ground again through a uh, EMI which is just like a little uh, that is just a little choke that uh, cleans up the signal I believe so and what is VREF? let's find out okay so this is a little schematic uh, from the bottom of the page and there is our U3, which is Paula, which is the audio chip I mentioned previously. And this, there's VCC, which is the voltage supply for the Paula chip, which should be 5 volts. And that goes through here, through a little 1K resistor, is decoupled to audio ground again with some capacitors, one little ceramic and one 10 microfarad um, polarized electrolytic. And that comprises our voltage reference. And what this is, I think, is a voltage divider. So VREF should be, if it's derived from the 5 volts that is the supply voltage for the Paula chip, this should be 2.5 volts. And that is exactly the bias we've seen on the scope. So let's take a look at this in the actual circuit and, and have a look at the scope again. So here we are with our board. I connected the power supply. Didn't connect anything else yet. So let's uh, just turn it on and measure our VCC voltage, which should be measured. Okay, apparently for the Paula chip, VCC, the voltage that should be 5 volts, is on pin 27. So that's, let's measure that because that's the voltage our voltage reference is generated from through the voltage divider. Okay, turning the Amiga board on here. We should have ground everywhere on the metal parts. Pin 27 should be this one. Yeah, and we have very close to 5 volts. And we should have exactly half that at the point where our voltage reference is generated. So let's have a look and see if we can find it. So we're looking for C306, the positive side of C306. And uh, this should be reference to audio ground. We can check if audio ground really is uh, ground earth potential or if there's a separate ground for audio. And we can also see what our voltage reference is at that point. So here's what we are looking for. Uh, this is C306, which should have our voltage reference at the positive terminal. And there's our voltage divider, uh, or the resistors in the voltage divider, which is R303 and R304. And these are both 1K resistors, so the voltage divider um, has the same values, so the voltage is cut in half, basically. That's what that does. Yeah, this is a 10 microfarad one. Uh, it has been recapped, but it's the right value uh, according to the schematics, so this should work just as it is supposed to work. And this is our op-amp, by the way, the LF347. 
So let's measure some voltages, I guess. So what I'm expecting at the positive terminal of C306 is our voltage reference, Vref. That should be more or less exactly half the VCC, uh, nearly 5 volts voltage. So this should be a bit less than 2.5 volts. If I can reach the terminal. Yeah, there we are. 2.49. This is actually very, very stable. So and the other thing I want to measure is if the audio ground is actually connected to ground earth or if it's another potential. So this is already pretty interesting and I haven't even turned on the oscilloscope yet. So, um, Okay, so let's see. This is still turned on. I am uh, going to probe the ground. The audio ground should be at uh, the side of R304 that is connected to the negative terminal of our capacitors. So it should be this side here, I guess. Let's see if that is connected to ground. I'm just pro just uh, touching a connector here. Yes. And that's zero ohms. So um, audio ground from the schematic is the same level as the actual uh, ground earth. Which should actually be connected to mains ground. So let's also check if the circuit ground or case ground is also connected through to the mains ground, which should be connected to the protective earth pin on my main socket here, which it is! Yay! So we have our audio ground reference level is the same as the uh, ground earth potential. That makes things a lot easier. And the same goes for the audio ground here, measuring at uh, R335, which is uh, 390 ohms resistor, uh, that should be referenced to ground. So R335 and R325 for the channels for uh, left and right channel should be referenced to ground. Yes, they are. So that's our audio ground again in the schematics. That's just our regular ground in the circuit, so that's good. So as you can see I'm using an experimental two camera or two smartphone rather uh, setup for this. I'm going to see if I can uh, put this picture from the second phone into the corner there so you can see what I'm measuring and uh, see the oscilloscope trace while I'm doing it. High tech! So first of all, I'm actually going to do uh, the exact thing I did in the last video and just measure the positive side of the capacitors against ground. Uh, in this case, our audio uh, slash other ground, which is the same. So let's see. This should have our uh, 2.5 volts which it has. So that's uh, the thing that I measured last time and also output a sine wave uh, test tone so we could see that this is actually the bias that is put on the audio signal. So the negative side of the capacitor should have should be at zero potential. It should actually be at the same potential as ground. So this is the negative side you can see the, uh, yeah, there's a very, very slight variation there, but it's, uh, it is ground, basically. So, same ground potential. The other side has the bias, which is the side coming from the little op-amp. So here's our little LF347 op-amp, this chip in the middle here, and uh, that should have positive 12 volts and negative 12 volts supply on pin 4. 
This should be the positive 12. 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah, this of course goes out of range. It's now 10 volts, 12 volts. Okay. And it should have the negative on the opposite side. This is minus 12. So this looks good. This is our supply voltages for the op amp. And then we should have voltage reference somewhere. And that should be on pin 13 actually. Okay, so we should have our voltage reference 2.5 volts on pin 12, which is this one. This is the input for the voltage reference. And on pin 14 should be our output for the left channel. And that should also have the voltage reference as the bias on it, which it has. It's the exact same. Uh, and so should the right channel, <laughs> which should be on pin 8. Yes. Yeah. So that's our reference voltage that is uh, used as a bias in the operational amplifier. That's, that was actually the point I was going to prove in my first video. So that seems to be legit. Ground should be ground, obviously, uh, because it is the same ground in the whole circuit. We are adding the DC voltage on the positive side. The capacitor strips the DC voltage, the bias from the signal, and we should have a uh, unbiased signal on the negative side of the capacitor, which is exactly what we've seen. That's very close to zero. There's a little remaining bias on there, but that's very... That's not going to do anything to the signal, really. Uh, people also pointed out that uh, for this test you should actually connect uh, a load to the to the RCA jacks here, to the output, uh, which I actually did. I did when I did the test with the sine wave. I had my speakers connected, which have like a normal uh, audio amplifier in them. So I'm going to do that again. We're going to see if that changes anything. I guess not. So let's see if this uh, changed anything. So this should be still the same, actually. Yeah, this is the negative side, which has the bias stripped from the capacitors, and positive side has our 2.5 volts. And uh, yeah, the 2.5 volts obviously. Uh, don't make it through to the output. This should be very close to ground, which it is, of course. That's uh, the same we see on the negative si side of the capacitors, um, even with the load. So probably we should put another sine wave into there just because it looks nice and we can uh, demonstrate better what this does to an actual audio signal. So here we are again. This is the exact same sine wave, 500 Hz sine wave that I already saw in the previous video. This is probing the positive side of the decoupling capacitor uh, of the right channel in this case. we I think we probed the left channel in the previous video. Uh, this is like a full amplitude sine wave output from the Amiga audio output. This is before the capacitor strips off the DC component, which is like 2.5 volts. That should be at the center of this wave. So uh, let me just quickly probe the other side, which should be the signal without the uh, added bias. 
And I'm going to turn off the sound because this gets enerving. Uh, okay. So there's our sine wave on the negative side of the capacitor and as you can see it is like a centered sine wave that centers on zero. This is our ground, just the ground without anything. This is the signal on the output. So this is uh, measured on the RCA jack with a amp an amplifier connected there that I now turned on again. So this is obviously a bit lower because there's a load connected. But otherwise, uh, yeah. So here's how I understand after all this discussion and after my uh, measurements now and uh, I think this is how it works really. <laughs> so we have our little differential uh, amplifier that is powered by plus 12 and minus 12 and we add the voltage reference as a bias to the signal. The voltage reference is generated in this little circuit which is derived, derives 2.5 volts bias from the 5 volts supply of the Paula chip actually, uh, or the 5 volts rail in general. Uh, this is a voltage divider that halves the voltage to 2.5 volts and this is our voltage reference, 2.5 volts DC bias, which is then added to the signal that our little op amp outputs, which is going through quite some circuitry here and then it is going to our coupling caps or decoupling caps. There's a little ceramic cap in parallel with the main electrolytic that we were looking at. The, these are bipolar by nature. This is a polarized capacitor and this indeed sees mostly positive voltage and is in the right polarity to handle that. This, because of the bias, this is all positive voltage. And uh, this then strips any DC component from the signal, so you end up with the audio signal without the added bias, which is then passed on to the RCA jack, which is our audio out. So the signal is indeed biased with 2.5 volts, and then the bias is stripped by the capacitor here. And I think the ceramic is just here to filter any uh, noise that's left, the high frequency noise. I think little ceramics are mostly there to, to do high frequency stuff in this case. Not sure about that. If you know for sure, write it in the comments. I'm always interested in a discussion about this because uh, as you've seen in previous videos, I'm not a professional, I'm just learning all the time from this, uh, from doing this. So, yeah, this is basically what I wanted to show in the last video with a bit of a more sophisticated explanation. I hope this is uh, correct this time. I don't think, some people suggested um, measuring the differential between these two doesn't make sense really because both are reference to ground. One side has the bias, um, the other one doesn't obviously because the DC component is stripped. Uh, so the uh, one side subtracted from the other should just be the bias basically because that is stripped in the capacitor. So yeah, that's basically what I understand about this circuit now, after the discussion. And I want to thank, especially thank uh, Gadget UK 164 for doing this. And if you haven't done so, please check out his channel. Uh, I learned so many things from him. And as you've seen now, continue to learn stuff from him. Uh, yeah. And I also want to thank all the people who commented on this because this uh, is an interesting discussion. So. My verdict stays the same as in the last video, to say that again, uh, you can use bi bipolar caps. Some people would argue that bipolar caps uh, are adding a bit less distortion to the audio signal than polarized caps, but it doesn't really make much of a difference, I guess, in this case. Uh, you can go with polarized caps, no problem at all. There is a little overshoot 
as we've seen again, like at most half a volt or something like that. I read up on that and uh, polarized capacitors actually can take uh, voltage up to 1.5 volts in the reverse polarity, no problem at all. As Gadget UK pointed out, they these are particularly prone to failure in the Amigas, uh, these uh, coupling caps. It might be because they see a very, very little amount of reverse um, voltage, but I guess they are just it's just a stressful job being an audio coupling capacitor. So maybe that's just because they see a lot of uh, voltage changes in general. So it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with uh, the reverse voltage they are seeing, but probably mostly with uh, the use they see, so the voltage changes they see. Here's another interesting thing uh, I found while researching this uh, yesterday. This is a schematic from the first uh, A2000 design, which is uh, was mostly derived from the A1000 or the, the original Amiga. It wasn't even called 1000 back then. The, this derived from the original Amiga design. So um, they probably took stuff over from there. And as you can see, they are basically doing the same thing. This is our LF347 op amp. Um, we have on pin 10 and on pin 12, we have something that is derived from the 5 volts here. I think... Yeah, there's a, there's a voltage divider as well. There's a 1.1k resistor and a 1.15k resistor. So they are... Yeah, it's basically the same, but not the same value resistors for some reason. So you have a slightly different offset there, but it's really close to 2.5. I think it's a bit lower. Might be a mistake, and I'm not going to um, fully figure that out, because it's basically the same. Uh, then we have a lot of capacitors that are not present, I think, in the later circuit. They, so they, they stripped a lot of stuff from that. But then we have something interesting. We have actually, we have two polarized capacitors uh, as the decoupling capacitors. And if you, the, these are opposed to each other. So the uh, positive side is here and the positive side of the other capacitor is on the other side and the negatives meet in the middle. So this is basically uh, how you make yourself a bipolar capacitor out of two polarized capacitors. So they are basically using, electrically using a bipolar capacitor in this circuit, which is definitely a tiny bit better because you have like this little overshoot which is technically and theoretically handled better by a bipolar capacitor or by two capacitors uh, put in here like this, I, I guess. I guess that's why they were doing this. And probably because the bias is a little bit lower, if I uh, figured that out correctly, uh, they have a little bit more overshoots, so they might need some more headroom in the reverse polarity, which they achieve by using... Uh, four for both channels, four decoupling capacitors here. Interesting. So this changed in the in the newer Amiga 2000s. I checked that schematic too. That is basically the same as in the Amiga 500, uh, because the Amiga 500 again is derived from the um, cost-reduced Amiga 2000 design, I believe. So yeah, I just wanted to point this out. If any of you have, have has any other ideas about this circuitry, let me know in the comments. I'm always happy to learn. Oh, and just to show this, this is the um, Amiga 4000 that basically has the same circuitry and it also has the voltage reference here that goes into the LF347, but it has another uh, op amp that is here. If I understood it correctly for... Um, using the CD audio or for putting for adding the CD audio to the audio output which makes sense obviously
Yeah, so that's it for this follow-up video. I uh, hope this was informative. Hope you learned as much as I did. And I hope I got things more right this time at least. Uh, this is fascinating. And uh, yeah, thanks again for giving me the opportunity to learn so much about this stuff. And also thanks to my Patreon supporters that are going to be listed in the credits role that I'm going to start now. I'm in beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. So maybe this whole circuit wasn't that well designed after all, because they wouldn't have needed the bias voltage at all with a capacitor configuration like this, or bipolar capacitors in place. Hmm. Don't really know if that would work. If you have any ideas, put them in the comments.